Hi, I'm Eric Freudenthal, and today I'm going to talk about a little bit about programming with UDP in particular, about the roles of sockets and the relationship to processes and ports and the whole process of binding sockets to ports. So first conceptually, we've got a computer. I'm going to just make some divisions corresponding to areas, of, domains of uh, control. There's what runs in user processes, and then there's the operating system. Some part of the operating system is responsible for the network stack. And it's oddly named because the network stack isn't really like a push-pull type of stack. It just means a stack of components. Key thing we're going to talk about here is, of course, the network stack is going to talk to network interfaces. There's the loopback devices within, within the device, within the machine versus the external interface. And we've got an array of ports. These are going to be IP ports. They're numbered from 0 to 64K. And, of course, on our system we'll be running processes. So let's say we have two processes on our system. One's going to be a server who's going to wait for requests and a client who's going to make requests. And it could be on another machine that's going to send messages remotely, but we're going to assume they're going to talk to each other on this machine. Now, in order to communicate over the network at all, a process has to ask the operating system to make a socket. That's the interface you use to talk to the network uh, interface. So, for otherwise, just, you know, and by the way, the operating system doesn't even know this process is a server, doesn't know this process is a client, just knows it's running two two processes, running two programs. So let's say our server, who wants to communicate over the network, he's going to have to make a socket. So he makes a request to the operating system for in the network component of the operating system, a socket gets created. And essentially the server gets a handle, our server process that requests the socket be created, gets a handle, allows him to talk to that socket. And our client also wants to communicate over the network, so it's going to make a socket. So it makes a request to the operating system, which asks the network subsystem, make me a socket. So the server can talk to this socket, the client can talk to this socket, but in reality the client wants to talk to the server. And in order to do this, the server has to actually have his socket bound to a particular port. That's essentially the sub-address at this machine. So when I talk about this array of like 64,000 ports, they're sort of like apartment numbers. When you address a letter to an apartment building, to some apartment building, you don't just write the address of the building, you actually specify the port number. You know, essentially the apartment number. That's the port number in this case. So for our service, let's say our server's going to be going to be waiting for requests at port 50,000. That means the server process has to tell the operating system to ask the network stack to bind the server socket to port 50,000. So it makes a bind request, that's a system call, which connects that socket to port 50,000. That means now, if this socket wants to send or receive any messages, it's going to leave from port 50,000 on this machine. And furthermore, if messages come into port 50,000, they'll get queued up at this socket, which the server can then read. And so our server is all set to receive messages, and our client wants to send a message to the server. Now our, ser our client has a socket, it's not on any port, so it can't communicate yet. It needs its own port. So what it could do is make a request to bind that socket to a particular port. The problem is the client doesn't know which ports are available. There are ways to ask for them to be enumerated and then pick one that's available, but that gets messy. So if a socket is not bound to a port, the first time you try to send a message, the, uh, the network stack will just pick an unused port and binds it to it. Let's say it binds it to port 60,000. 
So now, if our client were to send a message to port 50,000, the socket would be bound to a port, to a free port, and then, a, and then the network stack could construct a message which would be sent to port 50,000, put on the queue for the server, so that the server could then pick it up. Finally, when that message arrives, let me just draw a little picture of what a message looks like here. There are a bunch of components to a message, but I'm going to talk about the critical ones for this particular communication. Every message, every message that's sent through UDP contains a datagram, which is the, the actual message you're sending. It also contains the, I, the internet address of the sender, that's called the source, and of the destination for this message. And it also specifies the port number of the source of this message and the destination of this message. So when the client told its socket to send a message, it could fill in the IP address and port number that it came from and also the IP address and port number of the destination. And that way, when the server receives the message, that message actually indicates the return address that's talked to the client. And that's how the server will know how to send a message back. So just in case any con confusion here, the message is created at the time a message is sent. And in either case, where the server or client is sending a message, they're specifying the recipient's uh, IP address and port number, and it's the socket that's filling in the IP address and port number for the return path.